when you consider those fellas, they travel around in cars, slept in the back of a car, and took a, you know, a bunch of saveloys and a loaf of bread. And that was their meals, you know, and that was their accommodations. Yeah, I'm Ted Fernando. I, I call Canamble my own, but I've actually travelled around a lot. Um, you know, due to work commitments, I used to be a fencing contractor back in the early days when I was rearing my children, which I have four. And I suppose when I first got involved with the ALSs, it was um, oh, early 90s, I think it was. Uh, so I've been around for quite some time. I believe back in those early days, because of the fact we had that uh, camaraderie, I suppose, where we had to work hard to get what we wanted. I think that's probably why, well, I always maintain, always will maintain, there was nothing better than moles. Tombo Winters uh, was a person who was very heavily involved in um, the initial stages of, of um, moles being set up. And he used to always tell the stories about how today we actually travel around, you know, we get paid for our travel, we get paid for our accommodation, we get this and we get that. And yet we seem to still think that, uh, you know, oh yeah, but we do all this stuff. But when you consider those fellas, they travel around in cars, slept in the back of a car and took a, you know, a bunch of saveloys and a loaf of bread. And that was their meals, you know, and that was their accommodation. So. I always think uh, when we have that minute silence, you know, my minds and thoughts always go back to those fellows because I really believe they're the backbone of the ALS and uh, without those we couldn't be where we are today. And I'm talking about Walls, like Walls is my, you know, little uh, bunny, I suppose you'd call it, uh, even though I believe where we are today is probably uh, due to the fact, you know, of all the regional services actually putting their end up to actually form a, a, a service that was actually um, pushed onto us by government. It's not something that we wanted. I think if we had our choices that we'd be still, you know, sort of just based around the regions doing our own thing. Uh, but having said that, I think that uh, we've actually come a long way in, um, in providing a service that's more, I think, uh, efficient than what we had in the old days. Peter Stapleton too, like he, he's been a big influence, I suppose, out of Walls, like he set up our original constitution. Um, so, you know, he, and he's actually gone right through, he's still with us and, you know, uh, both him and, um, and Steve O'Connor. I think uh, we're blessed to have people of their calibre, you know, with us today. Back in those days, like we might add 11 or 12 sitting on the board and that was the the interview panel sort of thing. So if you're sitting in front of 11 or 12 people at an interview, well, you can imagine because, you know, I, I've always sort of sat on the other side of the table, been on a lot of interview panels, but um, never, you know, never had much of an opportunity to sit across the table and be interviewed. Uh, probably once or twice, and, you know, it's very daunting, even, you know, between three to five people, which is normal panel sort of thing that you look at. But when you're looking at, at um, at, uh, you know, 12, 13, sitting in front of you there and looking around the table and they're all Aboriginal people sort of thing, you know. <laughs> and especially if you're coming out from the from universities and, you know, sort of just heading out and uh, on a career path and you're faced with this thing out in front of you. Not the thing, but, you know, yeah. all these Aboriginal people which you haven't sort of done in the past, I'd reckon it would be very daunting. Mm. But talking about interviews, you know, um, I sat on an interview panel which on a board again at Walls. And we had Mark Dennis come through. And Mark Dennis, I don't know if you know Mark Dennis or not, but yeah. And he was one of the most arrogant young <laughs> tykes that I ever bloody interviewed, I'll tell you. And he had the ability, everything was there, but this arrogance, I said, no way in the world I'm gonna pick this fella. You know, a, a thing, there was two that I actually tossed me uh, coin up with. Mark was one of them, and the other followed, and because the other fella, you know, had probably not the same degree of ability through the interview, I thought, no, I'm going to go with this other fellow. And um, the rest of them, thank goodness, they actually voted Mark in. It was my mistake, but um, I think Mark has been one of the, the highlights of, of Walls also, you know. You, you see people come through the system and they stay for quite some time. 
And I think Mark was one of those people too. Um, but like you said, you know, with the interview panels and back in those days again, you know, today you've actually got to have a certificate to be a, you know, to sit on an interview panel today. So back in those days, we just sort of, you know, we went with our gut feeling, so to speak, because mm. we didn't know a great deal about what solicitors were doing and how they perform and all this year stuff, what was expected of them. It was just a, a thing where I always sort of believe that always when I'm dealing with uh, on interview panels to look at how they fit in with Aboriginal people, you know, and that's a great concern of mine. Uh, you might have people there with, you know, resumes and stuff like that that's, you know, three inches thick and then you have somebody with a three or four page thing but because they've got the answers with the the cultural side of it, and, you know, and they're the things that I always look for. Oh, look, I think the young white lawyers wouldn't have survived without the field officers. And even today, you know, out in the western areas, I think they rely a lot on the field officers. And I don't think that's changed a great deal. There's um, a lot of prejudice, you know, across the table. It might be black or it might be white, you know. I don't sort of distinct um, uh, about whether they're black or whether they're white. I always look at a person as a person. But that's me. There's a lot of others out there that, you know, they don't like blackfellas and there's a lot of blackfellas out there that don't like whitefellas, you know. And, um, and to come into a, a place like that and just be left alone without any support, then I think they'd probably only be there for a very short time. And I think, uh, as you mentioned, I think those field officers probably helped the service together. I'm a strong believer that without, like, uh, those field officers, like you said, um, is mainly come from their local area. They've got a very good understanding of what's going on within the local area and um, they know about the cultural stuff. Like, I always believe that there's, there could be improvements today as to the way that the um, young solicitors come out. We always talk about awareness, you know, Aboriginal cultural awareness. I think it should go beyond that. I think they should be competent in knowing what the awareness issues are. Like, for instance, if they got a client that's on a mission somewhere or a reserve or whatever you want to call it, uh, they should take time out to just see how those people actually live and what conditions sometimes they live under. And that would probably give them a more understanding what culture is all about. What I call the black and white situation, you know, I always sort of don't like the terms but we got uh, a black administration staff and we got the white solicitors and sometimes people actually get the wrong impression and not understanding the issues, you know, as in um, the cultural stuff, I suppose, on the black, uh, the backside and the legal stuff when it comes to solicitors, you know. Uh, it's a different world altogether and I think if we need, uh, if we really want the service to go um, in, in leaps and bounds, we need to actually pull that together and not even look at it as a black and white situation. We just look at, like I said before, as a family group, like we're all one, we're trying to achieve the same uh, goals, each and every one of us, like these solicitors wouldn't be working for us today if um, if they weren't interested in in um, uh, the justice system for Aboriginal people, because their wages are just, you know, it, it just doesn't compare with what solicitors should be getting. But having said that also, you know, they, it's probably one of the best grounding areas of any criminal law firms that you can get in the world and I, I mean the world you know not only in Australia but because those solicitors that actually come with us for a year couple of years five years uh, at the end of the day after five years they could be actually handling murder cases whereas there were the a firm of solicitors just a private firm it could take them forever and a day to actually get to that stage you know they're still sort of writing little notes at the end of two to five years. So, you know, I always maintain that we're the best grounding and, and training service for solicitors. And you've got to look at, you know, what happened, I suppose, even Dina. Dina's such a wonderful person, but she started off as, um, as a, just a junior solicitor back out in Walls. Look where she is now, you know, and, and she's not the only one. There's quite a few that you could, you could name. I think Police is probably, you see a lot of difference there because the police back in those days they had more powers than what they actually got today um, because of human rights issues, because of Rickardick and stuff like that. Like I'm very disappointed in the outcomes 
of the recommendations for RICADIC. I think anybody that's uh, connected to the legal services, irrespective of whether like we are now or back in the days where we had the regions, I think they'd all tell you the same thing. It's never worked and I think that the um, some people actually just took it as a joke and I think they're still taking it as a joke today. You know, I don't think it's um, um, been enforced enough through the government bodies. Um, I know personally I'd like to see a lot more done and even with the uh, coppers who you know, do their training through Goulburn or wherever they do it, is to make sure that they're up to speed with uh, the record recommendations. Because I always ask, you know, when I'm actually going to a different town, and I'm sort of, I'm a 10 year gypsy, I'd spend 10 years in this town, I'd move on sort of thing, you know. But uh, always sort of, you know, when I go and have a yarn to the coppers to ask them, you know, they'd know anything about Rickadick, and most of the answer was always no. I said, do you know that you should be encouraging uh, a better relationship between uh, blacks and the police force? <laughs> Gee, we didn't know that. <laughs> so that's just a little simple thing to outline what I've been saying about um, the recommendations through Rickety. You know, it's absolutely bloody shocking. But in my time with the legal stuff, you know, I enjoyed every minute of them. But you get your ups and downs and, you know, sometimes you feel that, oh, what are we achieving? And, you know, just walk away from it. But there again, though, I'd love to see a lot more younger people sort of be involved with young Aboriginal people. And there seem to be a drift away, like when you look at our, sitting around our table out there, for instance, you know, you you got the oldies, all due respects, <laughs> young lady. But, um, you know, you, I'd like to see some sort of a form of a, a youth system sort of uh, brought up where we could have the youth sort of dealing with youth issues. I think that um, it's more important today to have a legal service what it was yesterday. Close to 20 years I've been involved with the the service now and it's probably my second love in life. My wife's the first, my family, and I was the inaugural chair of the state body. Uh, it's something that, you know, you sort of, you grasp and you could always sort of look back on and say, oh, you know, uh, Ted Fernando was the inaugural chair, he's the first, first chairperson, and, and that's something I'll always be proud of and that's something I'll always have with me. Today I'm the vice chair, but I think, um, you know, we've been going around about three to four years now and uh, to me, I think we were improved from day one to where we are now uh, because, you know, I suppose it took a lot to get um, five, six, six different regions to come together as one because when you look at the Aboriginal communities, when you get, say, different tribes coming together, there's always disruptions or different uh, communities coming together. If you just take, you know, Dubbo, uh, Orange, Bathurst, where they're actually getting people out from Burke and Walgett and those places, there's always uh, um, problems and conflicts from different groups coming together. And that's why I say that uh, I think we were blessed that we could actually come together as a state body from 50 different regions to actually come together in one and be where we are today. And like everything, you know, you, you have your teething problems. You've got to crawl before you could walk and then, um, you know, you've got to walk before you could run. So I think we're in the stages of walking and running at the moment. But there's still a little bit of fine tuning to be done and I think we'll get there gradually.